You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about exciting, creative, and innovative ways of living. Produced in Santa Barbara, California, Sustainable World focuses on positive solutions to environmental challenges, solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned to Sustainable World Radio. I'm Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Justin Hewn, organic farmer, seed grower, and seed saver. Justin is the co-founder of Mono Farm, located in Ojai, California, and also the co-founder of All Good Things Organic Seed Company. And we started our interview looking at some of the plants that Justin had grown for seed production. Here we are in the, I think, the headquarters of All Good Things Organic Seeds. Can you um, tell us a bit about this, Justin? Sure, yeah. Um, this is the space where we, we bring all of the seeds when we harvest them from the field. We bring them back here, um, either the to further drying if they're not totally dry from the field or to process. Um, in this yurt right here, we have uh, there's a number of buckets that have harvested seed in the field that have yet to be processed. Um, yeah, if you want to come in. Oh, so. wow. What are, zucchini and beets? No, yams. Yeah, the zucchini and sweet potatoes are curing in here. So we bring them inside. They stay warm and out of the weather, out of the direct sun, but in the warmth um, to cure for about two weeks, uh, which just really, it furthers the, well, for the sweet potatoes, it's going to help them to um, to store better. So I bring them in for a couple of weeks in here to, to dry out a little bit to be in the warmth and uh, and then we'll put them in cold storage and uh, and and get slips from them last next year to grow them out again the zucchini are they're cured because it, it furthers the, the maturity of the seed so you wait till the fruits are really big and the rind is hard at least 60 days from pollination so when we mark the fruits we know that that when they're really small we marked them just a few days after they pollinated and with the date and then we know when to harvest. But yeah, when they're big and the rind is hard, then we cure them for two weeks and then we'll we'll put them in cold storage for maybe another couple of weeks and then we'll scoop out the seeds and do that. But yeah, this is where this is where we have our seed crops in here. These are some screens that we use for cleaning the seed. So it looks like there's a lot of dried leaves. So you dry that and then screen it? Yeah, yeah, there's a number of, some of the examples of what's in here, there's some parsnip, uh, dill, tobacco, anise hyssop, marshmallow, uh, chicory. Uh, most of these, all of those are dry seeded crops, so a lot of times we'll just harvest the flower head, the dried flower head of the plant into a bucket and we'll bring it back here and we'll thresh it. Um, depending on the plant, that differs in method. It could be just rubbing between your hands or stomping. The chicory was hard. I had to use a I had to use a rock uh, pestle and mortars and artifacts that we found in the land to thresh that seed. Most of them are not that hard. Uh, and then we have a little bucket of tomato seed in there that's fermenting. So liquid. So you're, what do you do to do that? Um, you squeeze out the tomato seeds. Uh, or if you're doing a lot, you just throw the whole fruit in there and mash it up and add a little bit of non-chlorinated water. And you let that basically rot and ferment and get a little bit of mold going on the surface of the tomatoes and stir it around once or twice and over the course of now that it's cooled down it's more like four or five days when it's really hot out it's like two to three days but as soon as there's a mold forming on the surface they're done and that process of fermentation is breaking the gel coating on the outside of the seeds which will then um, after they've dried out allow them to germinate. I've had volunteer tomatoes in the compost pile. I wonder if the microbes in there break up the gel. For sure, yeah. The fermentation process is just basically mimicking what would normally happen of the tomato falling off the plant and rotting on the surface and uh, and that breaking the, the gel coat. This is so cool. And we're in a yurt right now, and it's very beautiful. And I see some plants hanging. Is that tobacco hanging? It is, yeah. That's tobacco hanging. And there's some uh, hummingbird sage hanging and some peppermint 
And uh, yeah, so this is where we, we dry herbs. We hang them from these clotheslines in here and it gets cold and fire up the wood stove and dry them in here and process a lot of, a lot of our seeds in here as well. Well, it smells really good in here, even though the tomatoes are fermenting. Yeah. Do you want to see where we store the seeds also? Yeah. So we're, we're in a, a climate controlled trailer right now, which we keep, uh, we keep at about 65 degrees, um, to make sure that the seeds are, are stored in a, in a cool environment and stays really dark in here as well. Um, we keep all of our seeds in, in, uh, in glass jars or, or plastic bags that are kept, um, stored in, in bins or in this, in this filing cabinet here. And, uh, this, here's some packets. Seed packets. Oh, nice. So we we print up the orders in the yurt. Bring bring the orders in here. Bring the usually the seed. The seed has already been processed. Or I guess in all cases the seed has already been processed. It's been germ tested, and we have the lot stored in here. Oh, and the boxes: medicinal herbs, squash, summer squash, culinary herbs, tomato, tobacco, winter squash, kale, lettuce, calendula. There's a lot in here. This is how we kind of segregate out. Uh, seed packets that have already been packed um, and then here's kind of a bunch of just general vegetables perfection fennel that's a great fennel it really is it's it's hopefully up there. it lives up to its name <laughs> I think it does I mean it's it's as good if not better than uh, the most popular fennel which is a hybrid called Orion this is an awesome fennel perfection yeah and it's impressive that you guys were certified but organic so soon was yeah. that important to you to be certified organic it was important to us. Uh, at first, it was not because we were already organic in the traditional sense of the word. I mean, we weren't interested in growing conventionally ever. So we were already practicing, you know, organically, farming organically. But it was a huge step for us to be certified organic. Um, and, and mainly the certification really goes with uh, being present on the market. Our CSA members don't really care that we're certified. They care that we're growing organically, of course, but the certification doesn't really mean much when you're selling directly to your community. But anytime you put yourself out there to the world who people that don't know you or, or haven't never been to your farm, they can't see how you're, how you're farming, it's, it's definitely a way that uh, the consumer can feel good about what they're buying knowing that the farmer went through an arduous process of filling out paperwork and organizational infrastructure creation and and just really being on top of what they're doing in order to have this third party organization come in and say, All right, you all are legit and you're doing you're doing things well and here's our stamp of approval. It really I, I'm I'm behind it now completely. And I, I know that a lot of uh farmers and gardeners just have kind of a, a political opposition to the certification. And I understand that. I mean, everything was organic from the beginning of time until 75 years ago. And, you know, it was just called food. And now, <laughs> and now, you know, they think that, well, the people that are not growing organically should have to be certified conventional and they should be jumping through all the hoops. And, and you know what, I totally agree, but that's not the way things are right now. And, it was worth it for us to go through the process and to pay the money and to, and to do all of what we did to be certified so that we can just be like, yes, yes. I mean, when we get that question, yes, we're certified organic. And, you know, I'm kind of proud of it. Could you tell our listeners um, what the name of your farm is and how big it is and maybe describe where we are and what it looks like? Sure, yeah. Um, Mono Farm is 1.3 acres. And it's been farmed organically for close to 10 years now. Uh, there was one organic farmer before us um, who was farming this land, and he actually named it Mono Farm after, you can actually see just down below you here, there's um, artifacts from seven to 10,000 years ago. Here we go. Matates and monos, which are just the, the grinding tool. Mono is a grinding tool. So people have been using hand tools here for a really long time. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I, I guess in a way we kind of carried that on. So it's 1.3 acres, and when uh, Farmer Steve, who was here before us, um, 
he got access to a larger plot of land down the road, didn't need this smaller plot any longer. And um, my friend and farming partner, Quinn, was uh, working for Steve at the time, and, and Steve just kind of gave Quinn the first opportunity to do something with the land. And myself and our other friend were just super into gardening, and this was uh, August of 2009. We just paid for water and paid, paid the lease, and it was worth it for us to just start doing something literally with no plan at all, but uh, we started out double digging, uh, doing like the biointensive method. And that lasted for quite a while. The circle garden that's right here, that's uh, maybe about a fifth of an acre total with you know less growing space because of the paths and whatnot. That's, that's a lot of double digging. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, it's something like 35 beds of, of double digging. Some of them were double dug twice. And by the time we got done with that, we decided to move on from that method. <laughs> I've done that method in my backyard once, and it was yeah. it's very intensive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I think that it's very appropriate for a backyard gardener. It's It obviously yields really great results. But, um, you know, we decided to just, we wanted to experiment. Because we didn't really have a set vision or a whole lot of experience coming into this, we really wanted this to be an experimental project mm -hmm. in many ways. So we've and still to this day try to maintain kind of a malleability in our methods and our ideologies of how we're farming so that we can just kind of go with the flow for lack of a better word and and really learn from the experience as much as possible not be too rigid mm -hmm. and learn what really works where you are exactly does it run in your family being a farmer or are you um, a first generation farmer i'm a first generation farmer um, a few generations back uh, my mom's side of the family um, were farmers in Ohio and Pennsylvania. I'm not exactly sure what started the inspiration. Uh, I was working for a retail chain and just commuting really far every day and kind of getting burnt out on the whole scene and somehow I, rem I got really inspired about natural building and started getting into that and that led to permaculture which really lit me up and I started uh, just a backyard garden as I was doing a lot of reading and it just something just kind of clicked for me and so I just followed that didn't really plan to be a farmer even when we got access to this land it wasn't all right this is what I'm doing I'm farming it was we just started coming out here one day a week because we were all working part-time at the time so we would come out every Monday for the first like two months it was just one day a week and we all scrapped finances together out of our own pockets to buy a little bit of irrigation materials and buy a little bit of seed and a little bit of fertilizer uh, and then we just were so into it that it one day became two days after a month or two three four months into it it was three or four days a week and at that point we just had such an abundance of food that we decided to start uh, the CSA and you didn't have to work as much because you weren't buying food as much I bet <laughs> <laughs> yeah didn't have to buy any vegetables just a few months into it so that was definitely a plus yeah and we started a CSA really small, um, just started, I think, I mean, with a single member at first for like week one. And then uh, a couple weeks into it, we had about four. So we started August 2009, and by the winter solstice is when we started the CSA. So it happened pretty fast that we had a, quite an abundance of food. And from there, it just grew pretty organically until we our, the CSA is still going. We have some just really wonderful friends and supporters and we're just incredibly grateful for the community that's been created around this farm and so we have about a 20 20 to 25 it fluctuates a little bit CSA membership yeah it's been awesome it's really beautiful here so for listeners who may not know um, what a CSA is could you explain that sure yeah uh, CSA stands for community supported agriculture it's essentially a program where uh, members of the community will pay the farmers to farm for them. Um, it originally started in a community gathering together and pooling funds together to hire a farmer to grow for them. Now it's taken on a little bit more of a retail model in a way, at least it has for us and for other farmers that we know, in which we set a price. It's $25 a week, but we, we get seasonal uh, memberships and year-long memberships where folks pay up front and then we farm and uh, we harvest every Sunday and they come and pick up once a week, they come to the farm, pick up uh, their share of everything that we're harvesting. When you have a CSA membership, especially when it's a year-long membership, then you know how many people you're growing for. You can plan around that. 
you can buy all everything you need up front, fertilizer, seed, irrigation infrastructure, whatever it might be. Um, and it's just wonderful. And through the process, just the community that's been created is just, I, I don't know, it's, it's profoundly awesome. Well, let's take a look. It's just so beautiful. It's so green and lush here. Let's um, maybe take a look at what you're growing here. And we, you can point out some of the things that you're growing as we walk along. Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, so we're, we're entering the circle garden here. And because of the circular nature uh, of this garden, and we've found that it's been more difficult to cultivate with the curves, um, at least for producing, you know, agricultural annual vegetables. Uh, so we've decided to kind of focus on perennials and medicinals um, and we've started to plant trees in here as well. So we have a bunch of mulberry trees, some peach trees, uh, persimmon inside the circle garden. So it's mainly perennials and medicinal plants in here. And I see some mullen, right? Right there. Yeah, that's mullen. That's common mullen. We have two or three, let's see, two other mullens in here right now. This is a dense flowered mullen, which you just missed the flowering a couple weeks ago. It's incredible. Uh, there's another smaller one over here. Again, it's just past flowering called purple-throated mullen. It has a much thinner, darker leaf, but these beautiful white flowers with like a purple throat in the center. Mullen's a great plant. It is a really amazing plant. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I mean, look how tall and, and proud that is in the garden. And then the leaves are just wonderfully medicinal. They're so good in a tea for clearing up congestion, clearing up... Uh, they're an expectorant, so they really help to clear up coughs. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I had this horrible cough once when I first moved back here from Hawaii, and the mullen and coltsfoot tea cleared it up so fast. It was amazing. That's when I developed a lot of respect for mullen. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's, it's also nature's toilet paper, yeah. which is nice. <laughs> and we have a bed of yarrow over there, pink yarrow, and there's some perennial chamomile. Lavender. This is Czech lavender. This is a variety that we're selling. Ooh, that's, an, that's an unusual lavender. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really beautiful. It's very potent. It's not as uh, I don't know, for lack of a better word, floral. It's kind of your standard Spanish lavender. It's a little bit more potent and pungent and kind of darker. Um, it's a good one for sure. Yeah. Let's see what else. Echinacea angustifolia. Ah. A hibiscus. That's a new one for us this year. We're going to harvest that, uh, I think, in November and dry the flowers for medicinal purposes for teas and also just get some seed and sell that through our catalog as well. Hey, your catalog's amazing. There are a lot of unusual plants in the catalog. I, I think that really right now what we're doing is just selling what we know to work really well for us and a lot of our favorites. And, you know, a lot of those are medicinal plants that we've been growing year over year since we've been here. So there's some good ones in there for sure dandelion we get so many questions people are like you're selling dandelion seed <laughs> I, know, I noticed in the catalog I was like good for you that's great now can you tell our listeners why you would do that and why you include dandelion in your catalog absolutely uh, dandelion is the most misunderstood plant on the planet basically um, the leaves are edible they're very bitter but that bitterness is extremely important for uh, stimulating digestive juices and just aiding digestion in general they're an amazing medicine as well. The leaves uh, are diuretic and uh, bitter, and they so they stimulate digestion, but they also um, stimulate urinary function. And uh, the root is by far the most popular healing herbal medicine for folks with hepatitis, for liver ailments. And it's, it's just an incredible plant. And you know, the tea, I've had dandelion root tea, and it actually, it kind of reminds me of coffee almost. Yeah, it has kind of a soft, slightly sweet sort of texture and taste to it. And chicory, which uh, is often called dandelion, uh, the root is actually a coffee substitute. So dandelion is kind of similar in taste and texture. Great medicine, awesome food. What, a, what an amazing hard times food. Or It's so easy to grow. I mean, it's a weed, really. Wow. And then is it um, the greens similar to kale and chard and what you could pretty much grow it in any garden? You can grow dandelion anywhere. Yeah. In, in your lawn? <laughs> in your lawn. I mean, you can see the dandelion that's here. This is in a, in a prepared and fertilized and irrigated bed and it's very lush and green. Um, but it will grow in just extremely poor conditions. But if, like most plants that 
do okay or will survive in poor conditions if they get if they're given a little bit of water and a little bit of a nutrient they'll just explode with vigor dandelion's one of them we yeah. do have some chicory back there that's gone to seed uh stinging nettles do you have stinging a question nettles are stinging nettles are great for um allergies in my experience that's what i've heard um i i can't speak to that i don't luckily knock on wood suffer from allergies but yeah stinging nettles another really really great plant and do you grow that and then eat the greens um, we have eaten the greens. We mainly grow it for the seed and we dry the herb and use it in tea. Yeah. And I, I see a lot of fruit trees here too, surrounding, I guess outside the circle garden. In the winter of, let's see, that was 2010, 2011, we planted all these trees here and it's kind of a mixed food forest. We planted about 30 trees, apples, almonds, uh, a couple of pears, a couple of Asian pears, peaches, so this is, we did get quite a bit of fruit off of it this year, uh, just in year two, at least enough for us for, to share peaches with the CSA, which is awesome, and uh, harvest a little bit for ourselves. So next year we'll probably see even more. That's really fast. Yeah, it, I guess it happened pretty quick. I, I like to just kind of look at this space and imagine what it'll look like when the trees are, you know, another five, ten feet tall and really bushing out and um, their canopies almost touching each other. It's going to be gorgeous. But um, tell us how you, what may, makes this more of a food for us than just fruit trees being planted? We're paying attention to the placement of the trees relative to the garden. They're placed in a way that they won't be shading out our garden. Um, we also space them in such a way that they'll have ample space, but ideally when they're, when they're mature that their canopies will just touch, basically shading out most of the understory, which will help um, just really, we can't have enough shade right here in Ojai. Um, and we're also planting kind of understory guilds underneath all the trees. So we have yarrow and comfrey established at this point, and we're going to continue to kind of, as the trees fill in, uh, spread out into establishing more plants in the understory that are beneficial to, to the food forest. And I guess in, in, in another way, just the diversity of the trees. It's, there's many different types of trees here, and, and we saw how that benefited this year. Some of our peaches got uh, some pretty bad peach leaf curl. And a lot of the leaves defoliated, but we had fruit from a number of the other varieties. And, and so there's, you know, strength and diversity. And for those who may not know, like you talked about planting an understory guilds, can you explain what that means? Yeah, a, a guild is a, a community of um, plants or anything really, but in this case, plants that uh, are mutually beneficial to each other. So. Uh, I guess a simple example in this case would be comfrey planted right about at the drip line of the tree, which is where uh, the majority of the feeder roots of the tree, where they're taking in water and nutrients, are right around the drip line of the trees. So comfrey is going to has an extremely deep tap root, and uh, it's going to mine nutrients from much deeper than the feeder roots of the tree are going. Now the trees definitely have some tap roots and some deeper reaching roots for stability but their feeder roots are near the surface. So anything that can aid in bringing nutrients up to the surface and down from the top. So not only does the root bring it up, but it concentrates in nutrients in the leaves. And comfrey is one that can be chopped and dropped. So you can go and hack the leaves off and just let them decompose in place on the surface. And those nutrients, mainly potassium, but a, a number of other micronutrients that it mines will be available to the tree. And the tree provides shade. Uh, comfrey needs shade. So it's, it's mutually beneficial. So it's basically you're growing your fertilizer. Growing our fertilizer, yeah. In addition to cover crops that we've really gotten into this year, but comfrey's a great example of growing our fertilizer. And it's medicinal. I mean, comfrey's an amazing medicine. You can make salve from, from, the, from the leaves, from the roots. It's, it's kind of an iffy thing whether or not it's quote unquote safe to be taken internally. So I won't recommend that, but I have, and I've, I've loved it. But it's, I mean, it's medicinal effects as far as wound healing are just bordering on magical. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah, you can't put comfrey, I've heard from my herb teacher, you can't really put comfrey over a deep wound because it will heal the surface too fast. Yeah, yeah, especially if you have a deep wound, you definitely don't want to do that, especially if you aren't 100% positive that there isn't infection inside the wound because the surface will heal so fast it could trap uh, whatever's inside uh, there, that would be bad. Now, did you um, know about medicinal plants before you started farming, or is this something that came through getting to know the plants? Um, a little bit of both. I, I became interested in 
plant medicine a little bit before starting to farm. And uh, what spurred it for me was I had this really awful flu. It must have been the winter of, uh, I think it was late 2008, early 2009. And I was just hitting echinacea really hard. And it was like the store-bought stuff, you know. And I wasn't seeing much of a change, and I was just doing everything right, and it just wasn't going away. And I really didn't want to, well, I couldn't go to the antibiotic thing because it was viral. So a friend of mine brought over some OSHA root. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but OSHA, it's also called bear root or bear medicine. And it's uh, in the carrot family, and it's the root of this amazing plant. It's just really pungent, just extremely powerful, and I... I chewed on some of that root that night, and I made a tea and drank some of that before bed, and the next day just felt not all the way better, but I could feel the shift had happened towards healing from this root, and I knew it was from that. And I could just feel it, and I was I was set then. I, I just wanted to know more, and it was just very empowering to be able to. I didn't have to go to the doctor. I, I didn't have to rely on any outside kind of Western medicine source, and in that case... Uh, uh, with colds and flus and minor ailments, I think the herbal medicine is, is is a wonderful ally to have. Can you tell us what this plant is? Yeah, this is burdock. It's also called gobo. It's um it's grown as a food in Asia. Um, it's also a, an awesome medicinal. The root is an incredible medicinal. The the root what we did last year with the root that we harvested was we dried it and stored it, and then whenever we made soups or stews, we re rehydrated the root into the stew, and it's just so delicious. The leaves are also edible, though I haven't eaten them, and uh, we've got seed for that too this year. Harvesting the seed, was that tough? It was incredibly difficult. Uh, as you can see here, burdock is, 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 uh, was the inspiration for Velcro, so <laughs> it has these hooks, like, you can hear that even. It, the, the seed pods, I guess you would call them after it flowers, have these little hairs that have a tiny little hook on the end, just like a Velcro. It's, it's really itchy and it's, it's bad to breathe in when they, they're dry and you're processing. So ended up, um, got some advice from, from our friend Richo up at Horizon Herbs, who um, basically described how they harvest burdock every year or every other year, as often as they need to basically which is literally you take the dried stalks, there's one left there, you can see it, uh, and you pass it through a wood chipper. And you have to be fully clothed, long sleeves, gloves, mask, covered to keep the, the irritable hairs that are inside that seed pod from getting into your lungs and your eyes and everywhere. So you just run it through the wood chipper, that breaks them up, and then from there you can winnow and, and, and screen out the seed. And so it was a, a really uncomfortable experience. So. <laughs> You're getting some serious value if you buy burdock <laughs> seeds from us. Just know what I went through to bring that to you. <laughs> and, and the seed is a pretty easy one to germinate. It's not necessarily hard to germinate. It's just hard to thresh. <laughs> so one of these little seed pods has, you know, 20, 30, maybe more seeds in it. It's a biennial, so it kind of looks like this for the first year. And then year two, it does this whole flowering thing. And then uh, is this, what, I what is that over there? Echinacea angustifolia as well as licorice. Licorice root is also another awesome medicine. Which, which is not fennel, by the way. Right. Yeah, there's there's a lot of ter fennel, anise, licorice. They all, all these terms cross over, and some of them are completely unrelated. So, yeah, licorice, it, it's, it's an awesome medicinal. We're pretty excited to grow that one, licorice root. And what about these, if you don't mind saying? This here is ashwagandha, um, my personal favorite herbal ally ever. And... Uh, growing this one for seed to it. It's actually time to harvest that one. Um, that's a wet seeded crop, so it has these little berries. It's a nightshade. It has little berries, and you would process them in the way that you would peppers or eggplant. Um, but yeah, the root, again, very medicinal root, adaptogenic root, uh, meaning that it just it has a, a, a normalizing effect on a number of different organ systems, and it's generally boosting to health and immunity. And it's, it's a great plant. There's more burdock, peppermint in the understory of the burdock. Back there is hyssop, which is an awesome herb. Over here is uh, Korean licorice mint. Oh, I've, heard, I've read about that. It's really medicinal. Yeah, it's a mint family. It's kind of a gentle medicinal, in my opinion. It's, it's a, it's, it has kind of similar effects as mint would, but not as powerful as like a real true peppermint. It's kind of generally just aiding to digestions. Uh, 
it's just kind of an uplifting herb. It's I really love cute. it. Really cute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very cute. I, I love it for sure. And the and the insects love it. Most of these uh, perennial herbs um, that are growing in here, a lot of them have the smaller flowers that are very attractant to the beneficial insects, the small bees, the small wasps, the native bees. So that's kind of an added bonus. And so you have this amazing farm here, and you also um, have a seed company that you started. And what I learned today was that there were no organic seed companies in Southern California. So we're here right now at the one and only. Yes, that's true, Jill. Uh, we, um, we were told by an agricultural inspector who came out to the farm that we're the only certified organic farm in the whole county that's growing seed, which shocked me because... Ventura County is such a huge agricultural county. I mean, just huge. And there's a lot of organics as well. And so that there isn't anybody else doing this just seems insane, really. If you think about it, seed is such a, a crucial a crucial part of the whole process of growing food. So we're really happy to be filling that niche here. And we started the seed company because as, as we were learning about farming, we were able to notice the different influences on whether or not a crop was successful or not. Um, that could be anywhere from too much or too little water, the weather, insect damage, um, disease, obvious soil fertility is a huge factor, the different influences of the soil, uh, mineral balance, etc. The, the influences are vast. and when we started doing this, we didn't really take into account that seed was part of that and that there's differences in seed and that lacinato kale from high mowing is not the same as lacinato kale from Baker Creek. Two totally different, uh, it's the same variety technically, but if it's been produced and grown in different ways, it could be profoundly different seed, greatly affecting the outcome of that crop. What accounts for that? Is it the region where the plant's growing? There's a lot of uh, factors that could account for varying degrees of, um, of a seed being viable or producing well or having vigor. And yes, absolutely, the bioregion in which it's produced, um, the conditions in which it's grown in, conventional versus organic, are just two very black and white differences. Uh, but even within both of those, especially on the organic spectrum, um, the, all the different soil influences, the pest influences, whether or not the seed was uh, produced, grown and produced and saved in some sort of just mass general selection, or if it was bred for something, whether that's a resistant to a certain pest or resistant to a certain disease, early germination, late germination, cold weather germination, uh, general vigor, which is something that we save for always, no matter what we're breeding for, you're always saving for general vigor. There's great differences in seed, and as we started to, we were actually reading about that at the time. I was reading a book called Growing Food in Hard Times by Steve Solomon, and he started Territorial Seed Company. And he had written in the book about when he was first kind of getting his feet wet in the business, um, he was touring a larger corporate-owned uh, seed company, and the owner of that company, which went unnamed in the book, um, the owner of that company told him basically that the home gardener is a non-critical trade, which means essentially that the home gardener will not make the seed company accountable for what they're producing. As long as the seed germinates, as long as it sprouts and comes up, everything that happens after that point the home gardener will blame themselves for or reward themselves for if it's a good thing but it won't be like oh that was bad seed you never hear that from a home gardener and the big seed companies know this and so all the seed that ends up in a packet on a rack at a big box store basically according to Steve Solomon floor sweepings from the bigger companies it's not intentionally grown good quality seed and uh, that's really what I'm most inspired about and what we're really wanting to do and, and doing pretty well so far uh, is just producing good seed, good seed that's organic, that's adapted to organic conditions, and that is reliable and that we're, I'd be happy to be accountable for, for anything that happens and to our customers uh, from their experience with our seed. So we want to provide for home gardeners and small organic farmers out of all the plants that I see, just this vast 
number of plants, how do you decide what plant you're going to, what seeds you'll save? Are you saving seeds from almost all of these plants or um, what's the process? It really varies greatly depending on, depending on the plant. It varies, all of them are different. So this Echinacea, for example, behind you, uh, we're not gonna save seed from that. Um, the reason is there's only about two dozen plants there, only about half of them flowered. And also we've learned that it's the second and third and all those further generations of, of uh, perennial seed that produces better seed than the first year. So the first year seed from a perennial often is not the best seed. So, uh, so there's two main ways that plants breed, uh, and that's inbreeding or self-pollinating and outbreeding, outcrossing. And inbreeding plants basically, for the most part, can pollinate themselves without experiencing inbreeding depression with generations down the road. So one great example of that would be tomatoes or lettuce. You can have a single tomato plant in your garden, save that seed and grow it again next year and for many, many generations. And you won't see any decline in vigor or health of the plants or flavor, etc. But for plants that are outcrossing that have uh, adapted over a millennia to breed in this way via wind or insects, uh, rely on a large population of genetics to maintain that that uh, variety or that species vigor. So, uh, plants like like Echinacea that that are that are out crossing, we definitely want to save seed from a larger population. So we have multiple beds of Echinacea angustifolia. So next year we'll save seed from that one. So it's great that you're doing this. You're you're um, growing the plants organically, and that people. I think wild crafting's great, but I know a lot of plants, especially like golden seal and ginseng, are becoming endangered. Absolutely, yeah. There's a lot of uh, poaching, uh, illegal wild crafting, wild harvesting that's going on for sought after, uh, sought after medicinal plants. Those are a couple of great examples. Echinacea is another one. There's a lot of Echinacea uh, purpurea. Uh, that's being cultivated, which is the easier to grow echinacea, but is often thought to be less medicinally potent as uh, angustifolia. And angustifolia is definitely, its numbers are dwindling in the wild. And there's, yeah, golden seal's another one. That's a harder one to grow. That likes really uh, moist and, and cool and shady. It's like um, we can love something to death. <laughs> yeah. We actually have some uh, some starts of OSHA. We started that from a seed and that typically wants a, I mean, where it grows naturally is in the mountains, in the Rocky Mountains, and in a much cooler, higher elevation, harsher environment than here in some ways. But, I mean, 100 and however many degrees we had this summer, and it's still going. So this is year two it's in now, and I think we're going to pot it up once more, have it in a pot one more year, and then uh, possibly put it in the ground and see if we can get it cultivated. So cultivated OSHA would be pretty special. So um, you're saving seed here, and then um, on your website it says that your uh, Mono Farm and All Good Things Organic Seeds are advocates of the Safe Seed Pledge. Could you tell us what that means? The Safe Seed Pledge was uh, innovated by High Mowing Seeds, a great company. We've, we really support them and, and they us. And uh, it's, it's essentially just a pledge that a lot of seed companies, including ourselves, have taken saying that we're not knowingly uh, spreading genetically modified seeds. Nothing we sell uh, we know to be genetically modified. And at this point, everything that we're selling is coming from our farm. Um, we will be uh, uh, sourcing organic seeds from other organic farmers, some hopefully within this region, and uh, we'll continue to adhere to that pledge that that's not something we're ever interested in doing. Yeah. Tell listeners why you do not want really to have anything to do with genetically modified seeds. That's, you know, that's a pretty deep question. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just not down <laughs> at all with that whole scene. I don't, I think it's coercive and I don't appreciate uh, altered genomes spreading via wind and insects and, and effectively cross-pollinating with... Uh, for lack of a better word, pure crops that have co-evolved with human beings for thousands and thousands of years, um, and the results of which we don't know what that will be. 
So, yeah, genetically modified. Essentially, the the organism in the, of of the seed is altered in a laboratory. The genes of another organism are spliced into the genome so that it has certain traits, such as a resistant to a pesticide or a resistant uh, or to have an insecticide inside of it. And uh, it's kind of creepy, and um, I want nothing to do with it. The thought of a plant producing its own insecticide to me or pesticide just seems a little crazy, especially if it's an edible crop. Yeah, and I mean, the whole issue, in my opinion, with genetically modified seeds is it's, it's part and parcel with industrial ag. I mean, it's not that surprising, really, that they've gone to this this level. That industrial ag on that level where you need BT impregnated in the seed to kill a corn worm, you're already so far past anything remotely resembling sustainability or health that the GM seeds is just kind of the next, almost like the next logical step, the next step in control. And I don't, I'm not down with that at all, but... Uh, I mean, even without the BT, the issue is with a corn earworm that does typically on like an organic farm. Some people who buy organic corn look for damage. They look inside the ear to see that there's a worm there, to see that there's a few kernels eaten off at the end of the ear of corn. So it's almost like the problem is a paradigm, not necessarily that the worm is there. It's that we've got a problem with the worm. <laughs> That's the problem, you know. But if you have 10,000 acres of corn and you're relying on being able to sell that to market and you're caught up in a debt system, I mean, the issue goes very deep. And uh, at the very least, you know, the, the Prop 37, let's hope that that passes, of course. In and California, it's a, lab a GMO labeling of foods, which would be great. Since 75% of processed food, I just read, is has probably contains GM ingredients. You know, one really great way to avoid, I mean, whether or not the labeling happens, I hope that it does because it'll impact the industry, which would be a good thing in my opinion. But if it doesn't, you know, don't shop at the supermarket. There's your solution. I mean, buy, buy bulk and organic for the things that you can't grow and support an organic CSA if you don't have a garden. Avoid. I mean... If, if you can't, if the fighting it is over and if, if this kind of thing doesn't work, uh, working within the system that's kind of proliferating the GM crops, avoid the system. That would be my suggestion. And take a look at the list of companies that are against Prop 37, and that could give you a good guidepost of what food to avoid. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. There's so much information out there right now. You can just Google it and find out who's in support, who's in against of this proposition. And it's very simple. I mean... The information's out there. All you got to do is look for it as to informing yourself on what you're putting in your body, what you're eating, what you're supporting, or what you're not. And are the seeds that you're selling through All Good Things Organic Seed Company, are those all patented? Are they all patented? <laughs> no, not all of them. No, none of them are patented. Uh, not interested in, in owning life forms at this point <laughs> or ever really <laughs> maybe next year <laughs> <laughs> no 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 patents and for those who don't know there are companies that are patenting seeds yeah for sure yeah monsanto <laughs> and all their affiliates uh and you know it's i just see it as being really unnecessary um even with hybrids, uh, which in my opinion, hybrids are not a bad thing. Hybrid, hybridization happens naturally in nature all the time. And um, it's been given a bad name because it's how home gardeners are kind of uninformed about genetics and they go to save seed from something that was a hybrid and they go, hey, wait, this, this wasn't what I had eaten before. But if you just, if you understand how it works, and it's pretty simple, I mean, it's very in-depth, but the basics are simple, which is just two distinct varieties of the same species cross, and that first generation is a hybrid or an F1, the first filial or the first generation from that hybrid cross. And that first generation experiences a profound vigor so and, and uniformity. That's the big thing, uniformity. So... As long as the market is demanding that, hybrids have a place because uniformity is not necessarily something that can be easily uh, selected for and bred for in an open pollinated plant. And that's not always the case with a lot of the inbreeding crops like tomatoes and lettuce and peppers and eggplant. You can get very high uniformity with open pollinated crops, but um, you can't always do that. And you don't necessarily want that. Uh, uniformity is not necessarily something you want unless you're going for a market. So 
for serious gardeners, home gardeners, small farmers, and anyone interested in saving seeds, uh, I would really suggest just educating yourself about hybrids because you really could use them to your advantage and you could use hybridization to your advantage. Um, hybrids, what happens the next generation, so if you save seeds from that F1, that first generation of that uh, unique cross, you save seeds from those, Sometimes they have issues with sterility. Sometimes they don't grow. Most of the time they do. The second generation, the F2, you're going to get a, a wild ride of genetics. And the reason that this could be used to your advantage and could be really important is that so many different uh, examples of the two parents that produced that original hybrid are going to express themselves in that second generation and you might have something that's never been seen before in your garden and you can save seeds from that and grow that and now you have Joe's backyard homestead squash or whatever uh, and it could also be really important in um, in finding resistance to different insects to different diseases so it's a great tool for lack of a better word to unlock a, a wealth of genetics in fact a lot of people doing classical breeding with open pollinated plants um, start with some hybrids. Like you'll grow a whole bunch of different varieties of something to get all the genetics all crossing up together. A lot of times there's hybrids mixed into that, into that group. So uh, yeah, don't be afraid of hybrids. Just don't expect to grow them, save seeds, and get the same thing. That's the big downside. <gasps> One very important thing is how can people find out more information about you and the seed company and how they can order seeds? And uh, You can order seeds from uh, our website. Uh, it's ag2seeds, A-G-T-O seeds.com. It stands for All Good Things Organic, which is the name of our company. Um, and we're on Facebook, All Good Things Organic Seeds on Facebook. Also, uh, we've got a great blog for our farm, monofarm.org which can also link you to our seed website. Uh, Mono Farm is also on uh, Facebook. That's M-A-N-O um, Farm. So mainly Facebook and our, our website and blog are the main ways. You can also get in touch if uh, anybody is in this area and is interested in visiting our farm. Feel free to give us a call or an email. All of our contact info is on those websites. So I always love to, to talk to folks about plants and seeds and I'm happy to, to share time and, and to, to help folks out. I, I really enjoy helping out our customers who, who send us emails about um, what the heck is going on in my garden with this and how can I you know get these seeds to germinate or uh, you know questions like that. I just I really enjoy that uh, community that we're creating online as well. And then is there anything else you want to add that I didn't um, ask you today or anything you would want people to know? I guess I just would really encourage everybody to garden um, if they aren't already. And if you absolutely can't, if you really have no space at all, look for a community garden. Uh, if you have a close friend or a neighbor that you can spend some time, just somehow get in touch with the earth, get in touch with the garden, because it's connecting with, with plants and, and connecting with that process. Are, are, they really profoundly change the way that you look at the world and the way that you interact with the world. and. I think that um, I think that something's got to give with the industrial farming situation that's going on right now. And a lot of people freaked out about GMOs, and it's understandable. But in my opinion, you can't critique something that you can't get away from. And if you're reliant on the industrial industrial food system, then I I kind of feel like a critique of it is sort of empty. So uh, get away from that reliance. Become more self-reliant. Grow some food. And I really encourage you to go through that process. And if you're if you're saving seeds, awesome. You, be a part of that because that's a part of the cycle. It's a really important part of the cycle, not to be overlooked. Uh, and start with good seed. Start with good seed. All the intention that you put into your garden, that you to tend the soil, all that time and energy and tension that, that gardeners know they put into the garden. It, it just doesn't make sense to do that and ignore the fact that, that the seed matters too. So that's, I guess that's what I'd like the listeners to, to take away. And also I had one last question. I'm so glad I remembered. But in your seed catalog, it, I think the catalog's dedicated to Granny. And I'm wondering who Granny is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good question. You know, that's funny. We've never been asked that before from everybody who's looked at the catalog. Um, granny is... A, is 
It's two things. It's my granny who uh, passed away um, recently and we dedicated to her. And she was just an awesome supporter of me in all ways. So it's dedicated to her, but it's also dedicated to uh, the general granny who uh, loves to garden. And it, for granny is written in really large print. So we want, we want, uh, we don't want to forget about our elders in this day and age. So it's, it's for, it's for our, our elders. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jill. It's been, been a pleasure. I appreciate you visiting me and, and, and talking with me. You've been listening to a sustainable world radio podcast. For more information or to hear our other podcasts or interviews, visit www.sustainableworldradio.com. Sustainable World Radio is produced by Jill Cloutier. Music by Dana Lyons. Thanks for listening.